Hello and welcome everyone to the RIBA International Awards webinar. My name's Emma England and I'm Head of Programme Delivery for RIBA International and today I will be your host. Uh, we are delighted that the International Awards are back after a protracted delay caused by COVID. Um, they're a great opportunity to promote your work and your practices and also it's a great opportunity for us at the RIBA to discover exciting new wor work across the world. So as part of the awards programme, the winning schemes will be promoted on our websites through social media and PR campaigns. And we also run an associated series of public programmes such as the winners lectures. My role at RIBA International deals with membership initiatives and events outside the UK. We currently have around 8,000 international members uh, with chapters in six areas, the Gulf, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, Sri Lanka and the USA. My team also manage um, an engagement programme with over 50 international schools of architecture. We also deliver the international relations piece of work for the RIBA, so that's partnering with other institutes of architecture across the world, such as the UIA, the AIA, etc. We also work with trade organisations, uh, such as the Department of Business and Trade, that's to help our members export their skills and enter new markets, essentially to win new work. So, to move on to today, we'll be hearing from an expert panel from the RIBA, but also more probably more importantly from architects who have won in previous years. Um, they're here today to be sharing their hints and tips to give you and your project the best chance of being a successful entry. My colleague, uh, Head of Awards, and also our Head of Awards group are here today to share more details on the entry process and the criteria, and to give you some guidance on how to deal with the awards platform. So after all of this, hopefully you'll be able to make an entry that stands out to the RIBA judges. In terms of the awards process as a whole, um, there's also an opportunity for our RIBA members on the ground to get involved in the judging process. And this is through being a local ambassador. It's an amazing opportunity for you to visit shortlisted projects, to go out and experience and assess the buildings on the ground, and then feed back to the awards group as a crucial part of our assessment process. We will be sharing the link for you to sign up um, as a local ambassador, so please do make the most of that opportunity and put yourself forward. So uh, that's enough from me. I'm going to now uh, kick things off. Um, we'll now be going over to our RIBA Head of Awards, Carmen Matteo Moreno. So Carmen, over to you to introduce yourself. Hello everyone, I'm Carmen, Head of Awards, and I will be talking about international awards, the entry process and the importance of our awards in raising the bar of global architecture. Established in 2015, the international awards are the architecture's highest global accolade. Uh, awarded to buildings that demonstrate visionary thinking, excellence in execution and make a distinct uh, contribution to its users, surrounding environment and community. So unlike you, our UK awards where you have to be a REBA chartered member in order to enter, uh, these awards are qualified to any architect, are, are open to any qualified architect in the world and projects uh, can be from anywhere outside of the UK. Uh, the Riva Awards are the world most regularly judged, uh, rigorously judged with every shortlisted project uh, or building visited by a group of international experts and awarded by uh, the grand jury. So no project is giving a Riva award unless they have been visited in person. And we are proud of this thorough and rewarding 
process. We then have this very brief scheme uh, that will help you understand the process. We're currently at the stage of submitting a project, so all projects must be submitted at this one point of entry, uh, open now until the 7th of December. Our panel of judges will then long list the projects before they are visited by our local ambassadors and subsequently awarded international awards for excellence. Then uh, the REVA will yeah, appro approximately uh, award 20 of the buildings and international awards for excellence to projects that stretch the boundaries of architecture and standards of excellence, no matter the form, the size or the budget. And you'll see some examples uh, later in the presentations from those winners from those approximately 20 uh, buildings. We will then recognize the work of one emerging slash early career architect uh, who are making a significant contribution to the field of architecture and uh, international architecture with the Int International Emerging Architect Award. And we will hear from one of them later. And then the pinnacle of the International Awards for Excellence is the International Prize, who is visited and awarded by our grand jury to the projects considered to be the most significant and inspirational globally of the year. And then on to the dates, uh, practical dates. Uh, entries are open on the they are open now and they close on the 7th of December. Uh, local ambassadors visits are around February, April next year, 2024. We will then announce the International Awards for Excellence in June. Uh, our International Prize Grand Jury visits will be in around September. Then the shortlist announcement will be in early November and the International Prize and International Emerging Architect announcements are in late November. And as Emma said, uh, most importantly, we have uh, our open call for local ambassadors, so please do enter, but also please keep that uh, in mind, that open call for uh, local ambassadors and architects around the world. It is a very rewarding process uh, and um, a very interesting one. Uh, we've always had very brilliant feedback. If you have any questions about what does it mean, time commitments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, please do uh, email your queries um, to awards at riva.org, and we will be very happy to. Uh, talk to you about the role, but also uh, help you throughout your submission for the Riva Awards. I will now hand over to Denise Bennett, um, who was the chair of the awards group, and which will and she will now present to you some more specifics about the criteria. Hello. I'm Denise Bennett, one of the founders of Bennett's Associates Architects. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today and I'll be going through the judging criteria with you. I've been a member of the RIB Awards Group since 2016 and have chaired it for the last two years. I've had the pleasure of being involved in judging the last three international awards and I hope that by reflecting on my experience I can bring some useful insights and tips to help you to make sure that your entry stands out to the RIBA judges. The awards criteria capture the range and varied aspects of what contributes to excellent architecture. It's important to quickly say, though, that this isn't a list to be ticked off, as we all know that the best architecture is a subtle synthesis which balances the criteria to provide the excellence which has been mentioned earlier. The criteria, though, do provide you with hints as to how to explain the vision and strengths of your project. We start with architectural integrity and note the project must be capable of stimulating, engaging and delighting its occupants, visitors and passers-by. Have a design vision that's reflected in all aspects of the design. Have a robust design that has potential for flexibility in the future. We're all conscious that our built environment needs to serve our long-term needs and not just respond to current criteria. We have awarded projects which are the reworking of existing buildings and which also satisfy the next two criteria to be environmentally and economically sustainable and to provide social value. To demonstrate innovation, invention and originality 
and select materials considering the environmental impact um, to have an appropriate scale and be detailed with rigor. Consider size and space in terms of the spatial experience it offers. A way to show this in your entry is by capturing people in your photographs. Spaces are designed for people to inhabit and use. It is also lovely to see the changing qualities of light, which shows judges the scale of your project. Demonstrate architectural and conceptual ambition, and then have a completed sustainability statement, including a response to the target, the target metrics set out in the RIBA 2030 challenge. The challenge is predicated on the assumption that we must all play a part in responding to the climate crisis. Each year, the RIB awards eligibility become more closely aligned with the objectives of this challenge, demonstrating the crucial role architecture must play in mitigating and adapting to the climate crisis. Whilst these targets are based on UK regulation and compliance, as well as business as usual benchmark, the ethos and principles behind the challenge are universally applicable. International projects should seek to comply with the reduction trajectories, for example, demonstrably achieving 60 to 70 percent reduction in operational energy consumption by 2030 compared to a typical new build of that topology and that location today. And we're also looking at materials. Are the materials you're using local to the project? Is this an important factor? And have you considered the carbon footprint? We know metric data varies depending on the project and the country you're in. And the entry form has text boxes so you can demonstrate in your entry how your project performs against this reduction pathway and what has been adopted in terms of the approach in order to align the sustainability requirements with the 2030 challenge. We're all on the journey, so your setting of context, experience and response lets the RIBA judges best understand the drivers and credentials of your scheme. And then returning to the other criteria, we have usability and context. So the project must respond generously to the public realm or environment and make a significant contribution to the community. So some projects such as libraries or, or a bridge like Lily Langbro are intended to provide positive impact on the community, while well, sometimes the community benefit is more accidental, as would happened with the Captain's House in Beijou Village, both from the last iteration of the awards. So we want them to respond to issues of accessibility and other social factors and have suitable structural and servicing systems. And as mentioned in respect of the 2030 challenge, we're looking at where your project is situated and the suitability to those conditions and not to an international norm. But of course, we have to also deliver the projects and occupy them. So the project will be judged on the complexity of brief and degree of difficulty, the architectural ambition and ideas. We'll be hearing from, from Kashev shortly, but his distillation of a complex brief has resulted in a building with a human touch which integrates with its surroundings and whether it's fit for purpose, especially in response to the client's brief as reflected in the level of client satisfaction. Its timetable, the project should not have gone over time without good cause and whatever the type of contract is, whether it's traditional design and build or self build and then value for money and budget. And that's important. The value is a really important thing there. And then the client and users feedback on the project in use. By now requiring that the building has been in use for at least a year, the feedback is informed by the client's actual experience. And don't worry if there may be certain issues still being addressed as the importance of communication and post occupancy knowledge is to the benefit of everyone. Then we have the, the two award winners with us today. We have the International Emerging Architect Award. So the RIB Awards always pleased to celebrate and encourage younger architects and our definition for the international awards being those in practice for 10 years or less. The projects represented by the last three winners range from a healthcare and hospital facility in rural China, the children's village in Brazil, which provides a school with residential accommodation and the Koan Karam central office in Tehran. We will hear about this. This is a multi-use building reworking and adapting an existing structure and using the client's product in an innovative way to produce an architecture which acts as a beacon whilst having an intriguing ambiguity about what is solid and what is void, as you will learn from Uman's uh, presentation. And then, of course, the International Prize is awarded to the most transformative building, which demonstrates visionary, innovative thinking, 
excellence of execution and makes a distinct contribution to its users and physical and context. The last three winners are very different in function, location and materiality, but display a quality which more than satisfies the criteria. As Odell Deck, chair of the 2021 International Prize Jury, said, Friendship Hospital is a demonstration of how beautiful architecture can be achieved through good design when working with a relatively modest budget and with difficult contextual constraints, a celebration of a building dedicated to humans. I will now pass back to Emma. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. OK, so we've discussed the details and talked about some criteria. And so now we're going to move on to the inspiring bit. Uh, talk about some amazing architecture. So we have two winning projects to discuss today. Joining us to talk first about the award winning and innovative project, the Kohan Saram Central Office Building, which is based in Tehran in Iran, is Human Balazadeh. Human's project is situated on the Sahari Highway and won the International Emerging Architect Prize in 2021. And as Denise has just explained, this is the biennial prize that celebrates the design innovators of tomorrow. So, Human, I'm delighted to welcome you here today to talk about your award winning project. Over to you. Thank you. Uh... My name is Suman Balazadeh, uh, founder of Huba Design Group and uh, winner of the RIBA uh, International Emerging Architect 2021. Uh, Sarah and me, we are very happy to present our project here. Let's uh, start. In Iran, we were always surrounded by historical monuments that have been built based on the requirement of the context and aligned to its character over time. Bricks as a material has played a great role in their formation working as a masonry and finishing monolithic building and a structure at the same time. On a larger scale, has led to homogeneous city as a whole. On the other hand, nowadays, we are confronted with the city that are shaped based on top-down regulation, unfortunately. Our firm has undertaken numerous projects to bridge the past and the modern world of following its current regulation. For instance, 60% of the land is allowed to be built in Tehran and two meters of outer built area is devoted to the facade design. Summing up each building with its organization of different elements like windows and trusses in which hand clothes and other things get exposed to the city walls and various material creating irrelevant facade that have caused a layer of facade collages on the city that are unre unrelated to the inner space. One day we are offered to design a building for an existing structure close to a highway while being surrounded by local access and a neighborhood including a park. Our mission was to design a multifunctional building for headquarter of cancer and building brick manufacturing company. By unifying the urban scenery, by minimizing the formic expression of building singular object and emphasizing the city as a whole, we wanted to entice different elements of the building, including walls, windows, doors, etc. As well as reducing the variety of building material that could somehow address the so-called issue while reflecting brick as the product of the company. As the next step, integrating building qualities such as transparency and solidity, introversion and extroversion, interiority and exteriority, facade and space, natural and artificial, complexity and simplicity, was set a goal to create a new phenomenon which not only carry a feature from both components but also introduced new values to the system, creating, uh, creating a new uh, gray area instead of choosing black or white that coming up with new material that choose an approach. Close to the factory of the before mentioned company, there was a glass production factory, which made us think about com uh, combining these two material to come up with new material idea. By trial and error, a new module creature was formed called 
the spectacle brick. It's strictly banned the other material from taking part in the making of the building and always kept loyal to its geometry. It worked as a masonry, the finishing and the isolation at the same time, but it still wanted to be more than that. The spectacle break formed the exterior facade, causing a new quality called resolution, which worked directly with this stance. The further an observer is from the building, less details is demonstrated, and by getting closer, more elements and details are distinguishable. The facade was transformed from a surface to a volume by extending exterior walls to form interior walls. This merge dual qualities is defined different spaces within the building while meeting the main design criteria. The building has a warehouse on the ground floor, a double height showroom on the next, an office on the, uh, on the floor above that, and the final two floors are a staff rest and residential unit. The spectacle break has no has not only created the volume and organized the function, but also has been aware of ventilation and light exposure. Penetration was a favorite notion for the spectacle break, making use of its semi-transparent nature. It smeared the exterior with the interior uh, to fade the boundary between the two, bringing the natural light inside the space while having the company of unrecognizable, uh, unrecognizable artificial lighting next to itself has led to delay perception of the building uh, in the mysterious way. Brick glass module capture access solar energy while controlling radiation and solar heat gain. An operatable brick louver system allow user to adjust daylighting and temperature with a 60 gap from the first layer, the second layer of facade contain the main window opening for natural ventilation. This system significantly reduced building energy demand. Some of the interior space have been separated by glass partition to create a visual connection and allow better sunlight penetration. A spectacle break has made the building change of solid during the day to transparent at night. Also, green spaces play a great role in creating a more pleasant environment. Extended wall from five meter depths voids for light and venti uh, ventilation. Vegetation in flower bags filtered incoming air. 60 square meter of floor area is dedicated to green spaces that filtered and moistened dry polluted air, improving the quality of life in Tehran. The brick used in this project is recyclable, that uh, has the minimum effect on the ecosystem that is cheaper to maintain in the climate condition of Tehran. Therefore, design challenges were resolved uh, by merging these dual components into unique elements. It's also used this homogeneity to address the programmatic requirement of the project, which include both commercial and residential spaces for the employee. It tried to expand the commercial aspect of the brick showroom to exterior eventually to the city. Therefore, the uh, transitional role of the building as a complex of spaces on the building scale and, the, and a commercial object on the urban scale was formed. A spectacle brick as a newly achieved material that is responsible to dual quality seeks new opportunity to play its role to a larger scale, including the truss, voids, backyard, by defining the expandable simple pattern for the urban fabric, preparing more light to the living spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to hear about your wonderful project and the particularly innovative brickwork. Thank you for that. So we're now going to move on to our second project. Um, I'm delighted to welcome here today K Chef Chowdhury, who's going to be discussing uh, his project, which won the 2021 RIBA International Prize 
uh, that was the winning project. Um, and that was for the Friendship Hospital, uh, which was commissioned as part of um, a mission to strengthen and empower a remote rural area in Bangladesh um, and provide a medical lifeline um, in a coastal area that had been previously heavily affected by a cyclone in 2007. So, Keshef, welcome and over to you. Thank you. So um, this is where we are um, on the right. Um, you can see um, the green area that you see is uh, largely what is Bangladesh, the essentially the largest delta in the world. So the entire um, Gangetic sort of plain drains into this area. And looking at this image, which I have taken, you can uh, ask the question whether it is the um, water in the land or land in the water. But this is how the landscape looks like in most parts of the Delta. And we have been sort of um, lucky to work uh, in most parts of the country in various uh, topographies and climate uh, conditions. And um, the, on the bottom left, you can see the Friendship Hospital, which is uh, close to the Bay of Bengal. Now, we have been working on climate, uh, on climate action projects since 2005. Uh, when I say climate action projects, which has to do with, with the um, changing climate. And uh, these projects, this project, for example, is in the north of the country where the uh, annual flooding is a major issue. And we uh, designed, along with the same client, uh, Friendship, um, a raised island. So we were able to design uh, after various studies, a kind of a teardrop shop shaped island, which we sort of built for the villages um, to be sort of raised onto this kind of raised area so that they are saved from this annual deluge. And this is how it sort of uh, starts. There's a lot of uh, uh, thinking and a lot of um, uh, factors affecting the design and the construction of these, but I'm not, of course, not going into this because this is not our project today. And so this is how it looks like. And this is like a, you might say this is a landform. It's not really architecture, architecture, but it really does affect or save many lives every year. So we have made many of these. Uh, the other project that we had worked on is a cyclone shelter, um, again, close to the bay. And uh, in 2007, this um, cyclone shelter, uh, which hit Bangladesh, caused uh, death of 10,000 people. And, um, and, and I was uh, able to go to the affected areas the next day and take photographs because I work as a photographer as well. And, uh, and so based on our first-hand experience, we were able to design a prototype. And then after almost 10 years of trying to raise funds, etc., we were able to build the first prototype in 2008. And during normal times, so it's a school and a day clinic. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's made of um, just concrete, just one material, uh, because that's that's what would stand uh, sort of uh, the, the high wind and water pressure in that area. The hospital is also closer to the bay, uh, but it has its own sort of set of uh, uh, issues arising out of uh, the climate and also of the economy. It is closer to the border with India, as you can see. It's in a very remote area. When we were constructing the hospital, it would take us an entire day to reach, although it was just about 300 kilometers from where our office was, because of the roads were really not roads at all. And so you can see from this photo that um, all around are sort of this, uh, these fields which are inundated, with, with filled with water. The reason for this is because the water has crept in from the bay. This is because of the rising oceans. And I know that around the world there are many naysayers, but all they have to do is come here and they can see that the water is everywhere. This is seawater. And we are 65 kilometers from the coast. And between us is the largest mangrove forest in the world. Both of these conditions have not been able to stop the, the inflow of water, not only on the surface, but 1,200 feet below the surface. So any water that we saw in that area was unusable. So which was very strange for us in a country where, you know, there's, to use the cliche, there's water everywhere, but not really a drop to drink here. 
and people used all sorts of methods of uh, saving uh, rainwater, etc., to, to find drinkable and water with which they could bathe and cook and simple functions. So our um, project was complicated by these various um, issues. And of course, the economy was decimated. It's, a, it's an agrarian um, sort of society and economy, which was decimated because of this water creeping in. And so uh, this, this hospital was really to address the poorest of the poor. I'm not going to go into the details of the hospital layout, but of course we know that the hospital is like a machine. It must serve most efficiently. We have to avoid cross-contamination, uh, cross-connection, etc. And everything has to be, the, the levels of efficiency and efficacy has to be uh, really the top. And so we employed very simple techniques because budget here, again, it was very uh, limited. Uh, it's built uh, on uh, money that is donated from around the world. It's built on a land which is donated by a local person specifically for the for construction of a hospital. And so, um, so we had this issue of, you know, dividing the different departments, the outpatient department and the inpatient department. And instead of choosing to have a kind of a boundary wall, we chose to have a canal running through the site which would essentially help to sort of catch all of the rainwater. And when I say all, I mean all of the rainwater falling within the areas of the campus. And as a result, um, uh, you know, we can hold this water for, for the drier months or even during uh, the days when there is no rain. So um, that's, that's what the water sort of chart looks like. Uh, it runs along the entire length of the, of the campus and uh, also divides the outpatient inpatient departments without really having a kind of a spatial kind of a difference. And um, there's a spatial continuity and the generosity of space uh, sort of continues to hold. And again, uh, there were layers of control or let's say segregation and zoning very strictly followed, followed so that we were able to um, uh, avoid any sort of uh, crosstalk between uh, you know, functions which should not be next to each other, etc. And we introduced uh, a kind of a long corridor um, on one side. This is a service corridor it's for the service people, for the doctors and nurses. And this is, as you can see, it's naturally ventilated. Now, during COVID, you must have seen that hospitals have these dark kind of double loaded corridors. And this is something we avoided long before. And that's why this hospital functioned very well during the COVID because of this natural ventilation, which took away any risk of contamination, etc. And areas which were in the wind shadow, for example, or that needed to be air conditioned, sort of they were placed in those areas. So the, the water channel sort of collects the rainwater, but also helps to drain away uh, heavy rain because with this changing climate, this area is now experiencing more and more rain during the specific uh, times of the year. Next, please. Yeah, so we did a lot of study of how we could collect the water and how the wind on the right, you can see the direction of predominant direction of wind flow and also the sun would sort of behave and how we can get reflected light into the various wards and uh, uh, spaces. And uh, that was very important because we wanted to operate without power if possible, as much as possible. Uh, because power outages in this area is also was also quite common. So that was one of the reasons we chose um, to sort of make sure that each and every space has natural light and ventilation. So the water overflow is collected into that pond that I just showed, and then uh, the corridors are deep enough so that the solar heat gain sort of is avoided into uh, any sort of uh, ward or uh, patient spaces. So we, we turned the buildings to face the direction of the wind, which meant the buildings were getting sort of, uh, uh, the forms were losing their geometry, let's say. And then we had to sort of control the, the qualities of the courtyard. So when one stood in, the, in, in any courtyard, they would essentially see an orthogonal, a kind of a clear form and not a kind of a broken form. And which of course uh, resulted in this accidental or surprising forms uh, but that was a byproduct. The intention really was to make sure that all the courtyards had this uh, orthogon, although uh, the buildings were turning to face the sun and the wind. 
So only one, the predominant material is brick. The wood is also uh, locally sourced, uh, mahogany. And, um, uh, and these are handmade bricks with uh, beautiful uh, imper imperfections. And it's all, all just one or two materials uh, everywhere. The floor is just polished concrete. And wherever we needed uh, more privacy, we used uh, uh, these uh, screens of brick. And we studied this project in great detail in using large scale models such as this one. Next, please, um, which we made in our office and we studied them. And uh, we turned the water tower, which also houses the, uh, the filtration because we need to take some water during drier months from the ground and those need to be desalinated, etc. And so uh, that's in the tower, which is like a pivot and sort of uh, helps one to orient when one is moving around the campus. And as I said, so this is the separation of the inpatient and the outpatient department. But the idea really was to create quiet, calm spaces for healing, because we understand that while Medicare care is, is urgent, maybe urgent or important in the first instance, but as one is healing, uh, the spaces of architecture can contribute greatly towards the well-being of a person. So every space overlooks a courtyard or a water body, which of course animates these spaces. And essentially, although this design is, as I said, it's very uh, heavily uh, reliant on the efficiency and efficacy, but uh, we try to create a kind of a miniature delta uh, or deltaic landscape within the areas of the of the campus. So this is just a sketch that I, I made to sort of um, explain to my students, because when we care about humanity, it's really uh, two sides of the same coin. So care for the human world and care for the natural world. And I know that in the last few decades, we have seen what is known as signature architecture or star architecture. But really, uh, it's about in the world today, uh, in the changing world today, it's really about responsibility and a critical response, a response based on knowledge and not, not just information, but knowledge and not just one's own knowledge, but really world knowledge. And from knowledge, we would really like to move into areas of wisdom and experience, the experience of people who have built before us, who have known what it, what it means to build in that particular location or context or climatic uh, sort of condition. To end, I, I just like to say that uh, I was really surprised uh, when we were told that we were even shortlisted. Uh, we, of course, uh, for the RIBA, um, asked us a whole lot of questions. It was a really thick document that we had to send in. Uh, but at the end of it all, when, when, it, when they asked us to, that they will be coming to see the project, etc. We, we were surprised. I mean, I was very surprised because it's a project which is a very, very low budget. It's in the peripheries. We ourselves have not talked about it much because nobody can go and see it. It's very difficult to visit, etc. So it's amazing how a project from, I would say, the global peripheries can be brought into a, a discussion um, in the in the, one of the centers of the world, if you will, and uh, and and I think that is the that is the depth and and the breadth and the power of of a prize. I think because I think it's not about who or uh, it's really about what, um, and and I think we are grateful uh, on behalf of the people of that area and on behalf of our client, the NGO Friendship, on behalf of all the doctors who who are there. You know who. who you know, it's, it's a very remote area, but they, they're there for years on end. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for young people, as well as uh, for architects who are not really networked so much, um, whose projects are not really known maybe, but who have uh, invested enough uh, time, resources, experience and research to understand um, what our humanity and our natural world needs today and in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you, Kay Chef. That was wonderful. Um, I think um, that really embodies the qualities that we're looking for in the um, International Prize winning projects. Um, I can understand why you're surprised, but to me that kind of 
you know, it's it's the kind of project we're looking for. It's uh, the sustainability, social impact, uh, design quality. Um, yeah, I think it's a wonderful piece of work. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and Human again as well. Thank you for that. So, as I said, we've got lots of questions coming in. We do already have some questions that were submitted in advance, so I think um, I'll alternate between uh, the two of those. Um, I'm going to read out the question and then I will direct it to the panel um, who we think is most appropriate, but also panel, please feel free to jump in <laughs> if you've got uh, uh, um, um, items to add. So to move on to the first one, um, Abdul, uh, who um, sent us a question in from Mumbai. Um, and Carmen, I think this is probably one for you because it's about criteria and, and the process. Um, why do we award 20 recipients to win the RIBA International Awards for Excellence, but only one international prize and one international emerging architect? So international awards for excellence we talk about 20 but they're not 20 every year we this is just a kind of estimate number that we give but it's really really all about the the quality of the entries that come through if we've got enough quality uh, for 40 we'll do 40 it might be 35 maybe uh, 29 it might be 10 so it really is up to the quality and that criteria that Denise was talking about before and we not really have we don't have Orders we don't have, we don't aim for a number. It really depends on on the judges and the quality of the projects. And yes, then we have shortlist for international prize, which is generally four, and then a winner, which is one. And then we have the emerging uh, architect, which is one. So it works as a kind of pyramid with that kind of uh, special award for the emerging architect. Thank you, Emma. Great, thanks Carmen. So not necessarily restricted to 20. Uh, hopefully we'll have more than 20 this time round. So uh, thanks for that question, Abdul. Um, I'll take one from the chat now um, and uh, this is for Human. Human, uh, what's your advice for early career architects um, around the world working internationally? I uh, actually suggest that uh, believe uh, themselves I never believed that uh, this project could uh, win uh, or significant as a, a winner of our RIBA, actually. And uh, with this limitation that we faced uh, on this project, uh, why not? <laughs> I can uh, say that uh, every person could uh, create a, a specific project uh, with nothing, actually. And uh, this platform uh, is very important uh, to a firm uh, like us to uh, show their project and uh, show they're talented. Thank you. So believe in yourself <laughs> and make the most of the opportunities that the awards give you as a promotional platform. Yeah. Perfect answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, so next question um, from the other side of the world. Uh, Sara from Argentina um, has asked, um, she's she's thinking of submitting a public building used daily. Uh, she says it's used by the local community, but in the photographs, she hasn't got any people in it. Um, is it important to have people in the photographs we upload of the building or should we focus more on the materiality and context? Uh, great question. Denise, I know you've actually touched in this on your presentation, so I'll hand that one over to you. 
it is one of those things that we are we're designing buildings for people to to use whether they're living or being educated being being cared for um so if at all possible it is good to have people in the building it helps to give an idea of the the scale and almost the ambiance but we do realize that certain projects it's not possible to go and take photographs i mean for lots of reasons if it's in schools you actually do have safeguarding issues so we appreciate that it is not always possible ideally yes but perhaps no so I think the really important thing is to actually make sure that the scale of the project is across. So I think you know having people in drawings, like going back to the the old ones, in order for people to be able to understand and to see the the flow of spaces, etc. I don't know whether Kajef or Uman would like to to add to that. Yes, I I think both. Um, I think we need. Um people in the photographs using the building because mm -hmm. how people interact with buildings I think it is the most important spaces really how they interact in the mm -hmm. space and how they move about etc and uh, and I think also the context when we talk about the context I, I don't think it's separate from the people it the people mm -hmm. are part of the context and and so uh, both with and without because sometimes uh, with people, it can be a little bit distracting, especially if the human figure, mm -hmm. let's say, it, it, you know, draws too much of your attention or is blurred, and then it's maybe difficult to read the photograph or the image uh, in terms of this, you know, the spatial quality, etc. But uh, I think both. Uh, some images uh, should at least have uh, the human uh, sort of aspect. Yes. Yeah. Uh, as uh, Kasha said, that uh, it's important to feel the context and uh, one of the important things in the context is people and people uh, maybe in some project uh, give uh, the jury a good idea about the people who use this project or who use react in the atmosphere of the project so uh, in my belief in some project especially in a public project it is important uh, use of the spaces and feel the people inside it. Great, thanks everyone. I think that's really helpful. So I'm going to move on to a question from Mark, um, which is about um, entering a different um, typology of project. Um, He's considering entering a private house slash architect uh, artist, sorry, studio, um, which is regenerating an old farm building in Iceland. Um, is social impact an absolute criteria or cultural impact significant? Um, Denise, I'm going to go to you uh, to answer that one. Well, as I said, the, the criteria, criteria are a guidance but they're not a checklist. Not all projects will actually tick every single box if there was a box. So the really important thing we're looking for is, is the synthesis, the architectural quality. And yes, there, there will be very, very small projects which actually may only serve one or two people and the social impact would be very, very small, but still very, very well done. So don't look upon it as a, a straitjacket in terms of the criteria. Um, we are actually looking for, for quality and the benefit it brings, whether it's to, to one person or, or a city. So please do enter it. Great. Thanks, Denise. Um, another one about uh, details of entering, entry materials. So Carmen, probably one for you about drawings. Um, what about the drawings? Can they have some residential, sorry, referential explanatory images included or is it just drawings? I assume kind of technical drawings. We're talking about drawings, but it's it really depends on how they explain their project the best. So they basically we give them a platform you can enter x amount of drawings x amount of images choose what is going to show your project the best what what, what can you bring in uh, and submit that will help the judges understand for example when a, a question that judges ask a lot is what was there on the site before uh, when there's some sort of um 
when they when you're using the structure of a building that was there before, what was it? So it's always very useful to show clearly in an image what was there before or a before and after if it's a refurbishment. Uh, so really pick and choose what you think are the documents that will explain to the judges the most. Uh, and if you have any questions, please submit them to awards at rebattle.org because we can help you. We can just have a conversation with you and you can say, well, I'm about to submit this kind of project. It's a bit different. What do you think I should submit? Uh, and we can help you navigate that process. Emma, can Break I just it. add a can I add a small Please point? Do. Uh, we all know that you know projects can take a very very long time. We we live with them. We we worry about them, um, and we end up so close to it that actually we assume that everybody else has a degree of knowledge. So I think the really important thing is when you're making your submission to look at it with with fresh eyes. You're taking us on a, a voyage of discovery of your project. You're taking on a, us on a visit to the building, um, and it's really important that you take us. On, on that visit and you don't assume that we know and understand things. And the other thing is that when it comes to, it's already been alluded to, you know, the, the projects are discussed numerous times at the various stages. And what is fascinating is actually how more and more iterations of understanding a building actually releases greater knowledge of the, the depth of thought that's gone into it. Um, so as I say, try to look at your submission with a fresh eye um, and it, because you are actually showing it to people who've never seen it before and may not know the, the locality. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've, I've got two I'm going to combine. Is it OK that the uh, residential building is currently empty, but it has been occupied for longer than 12 months? And then another one about materials. Um, can we put in more material than asked for, e.g. photography? So Carmen to you and then anybody else. Yeah, in terms of uh, the, the so in terms of residential and office buildings, they go through phases and the the easier thing here is that they get in touch with us directly because I would have to ask them why is it empty and we can just have a, a quick conversation about it because if it has been occupied for longer than 12 months and you have uh, the data for the building, it is eligible, but we just need to understand uh, a bit more detail. So that that one I think is for us for them to just drop us an email and we can mm -hmm. have a conversation about that. What was the other one? Um, uh, can we submit more material than asked for, such as photos, additional right. material? I think there is a limit to the number of photos and is in there. I think there's 10 photos, isn't it? Uh, that they can submit. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have uh, uh, that much space uh, to <laughs> To, to the capture platform. all the photos that you would like. So please select, <laughs> as Denise said, take us through that journey and select those photos carefully. Great. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Denise, I'm going to come to you about sustainability. Um, there's a, a question in the chat. We've also had one um, put in beforehand. Um, what aspects of say, sustainability and human focus are you most looking for? That's from Clementine in France. And then the question here in the chat, when entering my building, I'm struggling to understand the parameters in the sustainability form. Uh, project is very sustainable, but in country, and this is something that we are aware of, mm -hmm. and this is a commonality across international standards and requirements, mm -hmm. etc. So, Denise, how do you how do you recommend that our entrants um, apply uh, 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 explain the sustainability information for the judges? I think they've got to look upon the, the form as a, a guidance, but not being utterly prescriptive because we do know that the situation varies so much in different parts of the world. Um, we thought it important to put in um, certain um, requirements on the understanding that in the more developed parts of Global North, people are more likely to be able to, to answer those questions. Um, but it's not so prescriptive that if you cannot actually answer the question that you actually don't get considered. What we're actually looking for in many respects is the, the sharing of knowledge 
and actually going on the, the journey um, in order to ad address climate change. So this is not a, a yes or no kind of answer. We want you to actually explain what has been the, the drivers of your project. So, for example, you know, Cachess um, Hospital, you know, that, that whole notion of, of well, relation to um, to climate, but the handling of water, etc., and looking look, using local materials was incredibly strong and persuasive. Um, but other projects would be driven actually by, you know, actually touching the ground very, very likely by using local timber, etc. So please just tell us what your project is about, rather than thinking that you actually are being set a, an exam um, to, to be marked on. We, we're slightly different when it comes to the uh, the RIBA uh, regional and national awards within the UK. Um, we are more prescriptive and we are becoming more prescriptive year on year in terms of the information to be submitted. But we do realise that when we're looking at the, 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 the global situation, um, it varies so much. So just explain to us what you've been doing and don't feel that you necessarily have to put in um, the, the numerical ma ma uh, metrics. Great, thanks. And I think the overarching theme is we're here to help. Any questions, please reach out to us. Um, we'll be able to guide you through your entry. So anything that you're not sure of, then please do get in touch with the awards team. So I'm conscious of time. We are one minute over, but just quickly want to ask uh, Human and Keshef, because we've got you here, uh, what are your top tips for getting a successful entry? <laughs> into the awards scheme. So Human, do you want to go first? Some quick top tips. Uh, documents is very important. Uh, every entry prepare uh, to uh, show the quality for uh, each project is very important. Maybe one picture or maybe one drawing show the whole idea of a project or maybe a text, a very simple text, show the main idea of each project. Uh, uh, but the quality of each document is very important, I think. Great, yes, good advice, thank you. K Kashev? Yes, so, um, so I think the RIBA judging process um, is very, Thorough. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. And the more information and correct information one submits, it helps. Because you see, our for our case, I can say that we were very careful and very, very, uh, let's say, tr we tried to be accurate and we tried to furnish all the information that was asked of us. But then I think one needs to understand that this is about architecture at the end of the day. So we need to explain the architecture, as as um, Denise has said, to be able to take people there, um, to, to be able to walk through or move through the buildings and the spaces. And that's very important. So it's not all just numbers and figures, but it's also about the quality mm -hmm. of, of, of it all, the, the, mm -hmm. the whole. And, mm -hmm. and for that, I think it's important that one chooses the project rightly. And for us, I mean, we it was a challenge for us in the office. I, I asked the people, what do you think? And everybody said, oh, it's a hospital. I mean, <laughs> it's not every day that people are interested in a hospital design or something. But for us, it was not a hospital. It was architecture and and the enrichment of people's lives through spaces and designs. As yeah. That's what we do. That's what all of us are doing. So yeah. I think uh, to, be, to be brave enough to submit projects which are anywhere, and uh, in the world and which uh, the architect feels have uh, they have invested enough uh, thought and and pain mm -hmm. uh, to sort of uh, come up with solutions that are not just uh, uh, kind of uh, numbers as i said but really architecture at the end of the day and mm -hmm. i'm sure uh, they will be judged um, with the right kind of uh, intensity that is required of those projects. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Please submit your projects from anywhere. Um, uh, that That's exactly uh, what we're hoping to achieve uh, through this kind of seminar. I'm going to wrap up now. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. 
but I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us here today. Thanks Human and Sara and Kashef. Thank you for sharing your wonderful projects with us. It's been totally wonderful and inspirational to hear about them today. Um, and thanks Carmen and thanks Denise for sharing details on the process. I um, also just want to quickly thank um, our colleagues behind the scene who are producing the events. Uh, we've got Beer and Lee. Thanks, Beer and Lee, for joining us today to make the event successful. Um, and finally, thanks to you, all our audience, for joining us. I hope we've been able to shed some light on the process for you. Um, and we will look forward to receiving all of your wonderful entries to the awards. <laughs> thanks very much. Goodbye.